This is Contemporary Philosophy. My name is Mark Thorsby, and in this video series, we're taking a look at some uh, contemporary philosophers, philosophers from the 20th and 21st centuries, um, and taking a look at how the problem of language has shaped the contemporary world. In our last video, we took a look, we began our study of Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, and we talked about the idea that Wittgenstein understands language as something very different than it being a systematic structure uh, that's organized according to a specific set of logical rules. Instead, Wittgenstein asks us to think of language as a city. Well, what we're going to do today is we're going to continue our discussion of the philosophical investigations. We're going to see that Wittgenstein is going to continue to uh, explore this analogy or this idea of language games. He's going to take particular, particular interest to the question of rules and rule following. And then in addition, we're going to see Wittgenstein emphasize a sort of dual understanding of philosophy. On the one hand, he sees philosophy, classical philosophy, as a type of nonsense. And on the other hand, he sees philosophy as a type of therapy. Um, and of course, there's much, much more in the investigations than we could actually cover um, in this video. So I encourage you to, of course, read through his text closely, and you'll see that there's lots more going on except than these things. But I think these represent some of the high points and some of the major elements of the text that I really want to convey. Um, so let's get right into it. You can see since we're talking about rule following here, I put a ruler up here just to sort of give you an example. But let's sort of begin here in uh, where we left off last time around roughly around section 75 of the investigations. I think we actually ended on 70 or 73 or something like that. But here in 70, section 75, Wittgenstein asked the question, well, what does it mean to know what a game is exactly? Because if we're going to understand our language as a series of games that we play and we recognize them in terms of the way in which we use language, well, this asks the question, well, how does one know what language games they're playing when they're playing them? In other words, how do we know what the rules are? Is there some sort of unformulated definition for these rules, because consider, for instance, the way in which you might use, I think an example I gave last time was um, the way in which you might use the word soul. So if you go to, if you're religious, you might use the word soul with your religious friends to refer to the thing that's essential to you, your spirit or something like this, or the ghost in the shell, you might say. But if you're using, for instance, the word soul um, in the context of music, then you mean something very different. So how exactly do we know how to use these rules um, of these various games? Um, because there is no clear sort of definition we use, yet we do seem to recognize that there is a place in which certain rules apply in which, and, and certain games in which other rules apply. So there's a, and there's an interesting question here for Wittgenstein related to knowledge. And because one of the things I want you to, to recognize is the title of his book is The Philosophical Investigations. So one of the ways we can understand this is that Wittgenstein is trying to uncover um, some of the problems, or he's trying to tackle some of the problems the philosophers are really quite interested in. And the question of knowledge or epistemology is one of them. So what does it mean to have knowledge of these rules, for instance? He says, if I know the game, then why can't I express the rules of that game clearly? The rules of a language should be something like the expression of my knowledge, right? So for instance, if I'm... For instance, imagine if you use a word inappropriately in, the, in, a, in one context as opposed to another context. How exactly do you express this not, the, these rules? Is it the same way in which we express our claims about knowledge, the claims of knowledge we have about the world? Um, yet we seem to know the rules by showing all these sorts of uses, not really articulating clear essential rules. So there's an interesting question here about whether or not Wittgenstein's language games analogies breaks down or whether or not we need to just follow it through. Again, he's emphasizing the idea that we seem to know these rules according to the way in which we use them, not really by being able to articulate a clear definition. Now, so let's sort of ask ourselves, what exactly is a definition? Now, the definition is sort of interesting. Um, if you actually break down the etymology of the word definition, what you'll see is that definition is de, it comes from de and finis in Latin. Finis literally means the boundary. And you can sort of ascertain here that when we ask about the definition of something, maybe what we're really asking is what are the boundaries 
upon which that word can be used. For instance, imagine two people were asked to define the rules of a particular language game, maybe the one I gave an example of. It, it's not, it won't take very long before we realize that two different people could easily come up with two different definitions of the rules of a language game. And this seems to show that there's a conf that there can be conflicting pictures um, between the way in which people recognize these language games. Wittgenstein gives this analogy, right? Um, and he sort of gives the analogy, imagine there's two different pictures. Um, these pictures are not, of course, the ones from Wittgenstein. He doesn't actually give pictures. But imagine, for instance, there's two different pictures, and we ask people to describe them differently. Uh, but imagine that one picture is clear, where, for instance, the other picture is completely blurry, right? And you can imagine here is that if one person is to, def to describe this picture, and they're looking at the picture on the left here, or in other words, they're looking at the picture that's clear, then they're going to describe it in a particular way with a certain degree of exactitude, right? But if a person tries to describe that same picture, but they're somewhat blurry, their picture is blurry, they're going to end up giving a different sort of definition or a different articulation. I think the example Wittgenstein gives in the investigation is he imagines, imagine if someone's trying to describe a sort of red, um, uh, a red a box or a rectangle, but if the box, the lines of the block box are blurry, it becomes very difficult to articulate those definitions. And this is an important analogy, Wittgenstein thinks, for understanding some of the difficulties with which we have in terms of articulating the rules of these language games. He says in section 77, and this is the position you're in if you look for definitions corresponding to our concepts of aesthetics and ethics or ethics. And this is, I think, actually quite interesting because here Wittgenstein is making one of his first sort of critiques about some of the primary domains in philosophy. Aesthetics, of course, studies um, beauty and, um, um, and, and our, the way in which we value things. And ethics, of course, studies the way in which we ought to act and how we ought to act according to our values. Um, now, notice the debate. Think about the debates you can have with your friends, with your family, regarding, for instance, concepts like what is beautiful or what is good. These become very difficult to articulate the rules upon which these words might have meaning in a language game. He says, quote, in such a difficulty, always ask yourself, how do we learn the meaning of a word? Good, for instance. What sort of examples and what language game? then it will be easier for you to see that the word must have a family of meanings. And so what we see here is that instead of asking to articulate the rules of these games and the rule, the if you will, the logic that's embedded within our use of language, instead Wittgenstein says, don't try to give a positive definition, an essence for this. Instead, describe how we actually use them. In other words, what we're seeing here is Wittgenstein's invocation that we have we should move philosophically from a sort of approach a theoretical approach to a descriptive approach in other words from theory to a description of use which would make sense given what we've talked about now Wittgenstein sort of gives us this sort of example to sort of drive home the point for instance imagine if someone says Moses did not exist you can ask yourself well what does this mean now before I go forward and talk about how we can define Moses Notice that when I say Moses did not exist, you probably already, if you're familiar with who Moses was or is, then you will be, you probably already have an idea of what that phrase might mean. But wait a second, what exactly does this mean? Does Moses refer, does this refer to the idea that the Israelites did not have a single leader when they left Egypt? Does this refer to the idea that their, their leader was not called Moses, but called something else, maybe Joshua? Or does this mean that there cannot be anyone who did what the Bible says that Moses did, right? So what we have here is that you can see is that this simple phrase, Moses did not exist, which is very similar to the type of statement you might see a philosopher make. Maybe they would say something like, the soul does not exist. Um, you can see pretty clearly that there's actually a variety of ways in which we can begin to interpret this phrase. In other words, we define what we mean through these various descriptions, um, because each one of these descriptions really calls out a different type of use for this propositional statement that Moses did not exist. You can see that Wittgenstein is beginning to problematize our assumptions in philosophy that propositions have clear cognitive meanings 
that are essential to the words. Um, what Wittgenstein is really offering the idea is that the meaning resides in the contextual use. I, mean, I have to be a little bit careful there because I don't think that Wittgenstein's language game theory is simply a contextual theory for language, um, but we'll get into that later. Here's another example. <clears throat> Someone says N is dead, right? So you have to define what exactly does N mean? Let's say that N is a human being who one saw, th who saw the N is a person that we saw in such and such a place. N looks like someone. I give, for instance, maybe there's a picture we have of who N would be. Um, maybe we might say that N has done such and such things. We might give a bibliographic sort of picture of who N is. Um, we might say that N is merely the person who bears the name N, right? So there's a number of different ways in which we might define N. But now ask yourself, what if I'm wrong about one of these incidental de details? Does that mean that N's not dead? So for instance, imagine that I say that N looks like Elvis. Well, what if I'm wrong about that and you disagree with me that N looks like such and such? Well, does that mean that the because my definition for N has failed, that the statement N is dead no longer has any meaning? You can see here is that there seems to be a problem here because it looks like our definitions rely upon really quite incidental characteristics that we call into view when we begin to define the boundary conditions upon which a word might mean. Um, this is what Wittgenstein on se section 79 sort of refers to as the bounds of the incidental. What we do is we seem to use N actually without a sort of fixed meaning. It looks like the N, the, the words here, have a fluidity in terms of the way in which they are defined. Um, and they're not defined as clear cut as we'd like to think that they could be. And, and Wittgenstein even calls into question the way in which scientific definitions get formed. And this is actually quite interesting. Of course, um, when Wittgenstein wrote the philosophical investigations, Pluto was considered a planet. But for if you've been following anything in astrophysics for the last, I guess, 10 years or so, you'll know that today, Pluto is not considered a planet. It's now classified according to the astronomical experts as a dwarf planet. So now, so for instance, when Wittgenstein was alive, um, the, if you read an astronomy book, it would say that Pluto was a planet and that there are nine planets. Today, if you look in an astronomy book, you'll see that Pluto is not listed as a planet and that there's actually eight planets. But of course, the object in the sky, here's a picture of the most recent picture of Pluto, which of course Wittgenstein would have never seen or never did see. You can sort of ask yourself, the the actual object in space is still out there. Um, so you can see here is notice the way in which our definitions seem to change. And in the same way that we talked about there being the bounds of the incidental, it appears that not even something as rigorous as science is um, completely free of these incidental boundaries. Um, and this, of course, is not a critique of science, but it's, I think, rather for Wittgenstein, it's a critique with the way in which we understand language and the way in which we understand what the scientific enterprise really is, or at least how its logic um, is formed. I once had a professor, uh, a science professor, a physics professor, tell me that, that at the end of the day, the theories of science are essentially determined um, by vote, right? Is that scientists replicate each other's experiments and they... And they and they ultimately come to some sort of consensus in terms of how we understand the world. But think about it for a moment. If science is, strictly speaking, supposed to uncover the truths of the physical world or the truths of the object of that science, then how is it that science is really just left to a sort of vote of experts? How is it that science, uh, at bottom, or and there, that's debatable, but how is it that science rests upon consensus rather than the objects in the world themselves. And you can see here that Wittgenstein's discussion of language games begins to give us some sense for why that could be the case. Now, Wittgenstein also talks about a vanishing chair, and I call this the vanishing chair problem. It sort of, sort of imagines, um, and hopefully I'm remembering it correctly, I could pull it up, but is imagine you see a chair, and as you walk towards it, the chair vanishes, right? So if you have that experience, I guess it's some sort of ghostly experience, then how are you going to describe that experience, right? What you will say is that when you walk over to the chair, the chair disappears. 
But of course, if I ask you to define what a chair is, a chair is not something in an ordinary definition that can disappear. It doesn't just vanish, which raises the question, then if I'm actually having this experience and I'm using the word chair to describe that experience, in what sense is that meaningful, right? In other words, do we really have rules for all of these various cases of our language? If you go back to the way in which Wittgenstein described language as a city, you can ask this question, are there rules for all the different avenues and ways about in which you can move through that city? Um, and it doesn't seem that there are the same, that there are rules, or at least not rules in the same sense, that I think the logicians are looking for. People like Frege, for instance, or Russell. Here's, here's a quotation from section 81 that I think is interesting. And what we're seeing is that Wittgenstein's beginning to offer a, a more full-fledged critique against sort of traditional philosophy. He says, quote, In philosophy, we often compare the use of words with games and calculi, which have fixed rules, but cannot say that someone who is using language must be playing such a game. For then it may look as if what we're talking about were an ideal language, as if our logic were, so to speak, a logic for a vacuum. Um, and here, what we can say is that when philosophers um, seek to articulate a precise, rigorous structure of rules for language, in a certain sense, they begin to leave the, the world in which language has meaning, and they begin to move into um, uh, an ideal language, or they begin to articulate an ideal language that ultimately doesn't have meaning, and that's what it means to say it exists in a vacuum. Um, there's one passage in the philosophical investigations from the section where Wittgenstein says, there's no air to breathe um, when we have these ideal languages. And this is something important. To look for an ideal language is ultimately to seek after the construction of something. And this is problematic because languages are used, first and foremost, in a particular form of life. And it looks like what philosophers are, seem to do is they begin to construct ideal languages um, that lose their grounding in reality. <clears throat> Take a look at section 83 from the investigations where Wittgenstein says, quote, Doesn't the analogy between language and games throw light here? We can easily imagine people amusing themselves in a field by playing with the ball so as to start various existing games, but playing many without finishing them and in between throwing the ball aimlessly into the air, chasing one another with the ball and bombarding one another for a joke, and so on. And now someone says the whole time they're playing a ball game and following definite rules at every throw. And is there not also the case where we play and make up the rules as we go along and there is even one where we alter them as we go along. Now, you can see what Wittgenstein is suggesting here is that, is that sort of what the philosopher may be doing in, when they're looking for the ideal structure of a language is they're, they're, they're looking at a whole series of uses of, of language that go in and out and all a bunch of different varieties of language uses get, language games get played. And then what the philosopher tends to do is try to construct some sort of rule that would fit all of these cases, right? And notice how philosophers will always seek um, the universal, not the particular. And here Wittgenstein is suggesting that there's a great problem with this. Uh, there's a great problem here. And that there's a great temptation in a misapplication of language that philosophers um, are tempted to go uh, to follow through with. Another, another way is think if we reverse the thought experiment. Let me give it a drink here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Can we imagine a game in which the rules of a game are so airtight that there can never in principle be any doubt about what the rules are? So reverse it and ask yourself, okay, well, imagine we do have a game that's the rules are so absolutely clarified, so ideal, that there's no way in which you can there's no way in which you wouldn't recognize if a rule was broken. But now ask yourself, well, can another rule determine the application of another rule and so on? So maybe what the philosopher would say is, well, what you have is you have a system of rules which modify other rules and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so to address this, Wittgenstein says, okay, well, let's imagine the builders. 
And, and hopefully you'll recall from the first video and from the very beginning of the philosophical investigations that Wittgenstein gives this example of a simple primitive language game in which you have two builders and they only have a couple words like slab and block and so on and so forth. And when one builder calls out block, the other builder brings the block. Now Wittgenstein says, okay, imagine a slightly altered version of the builder scenario. He says, imagine a language game uh, like we saw in the second um, section that's played with the help of a table. So imagine you've got the builder sitting at a table, right? Now the signs to B, uh, the signs given to B by A are now written ones. So they're handing slips of paper to each other. B has a table. And in the first column, so they have a table they're using to figure out what the rules are, right? So here you have the word that you have a clear sort of analogy in which there's rules which govern the relationship of the signs between the builders. So in the first column of the sign, then the first column are the signs that are used in the game. And in the second, there's pictures of the building stones. So there's this sort of key slab and there's a picture of a slab, so on and so forth. So A shows B one of these written signs and B looks it up in the table. And then they look at the picture that's opposite and so on and so forth. So the table is a rule which he follows in executing the orders, okay? So the table is one of these rules. Now one learns to look the picture up in the table by receiving a training. And a part of this training consists perhaps in the pupils learning to pass with his finger horizontally from right to left, so as it were, to draw a series of horizontal lines on the table. So imagine that um, one of the, the rules here is where you can move your finger and this helps to direct how exactly, where you're placing the stones and so forth. Now he says, suppose there are different ways of reading the table were now introduced, right? So one time as above, according to this schema. So if it says slab, you move your hand over and then you got a picture of a slab and then you do that. You, you, you see there's a picture of a block, you move over, there's a, the word block, you move over, you see the picture of block and so forth. But imagine that at the end of the sequence, there's a rule where you go, instead, you go diagonally and then you move up, right? So he says, suppose there's a different way of reading the table that's introduced. Um, and you can see the sort of picture of it here, right? Or in some other way, some, such a schema is supplied with the table as the rule for its use. And then here's what Wittgenstein asks us to think about. He says, can we not imagine further rules that would explain this one and so on? Um, was the first table incomplete without the schema of the errors? arrows? and our other tables incomplete without their schemata. And you can see here is that what Wittgenstein is drawing for us is he's drawing us a scenario in which the builders are modifying their rules with other rules. And now you can ask yourself, will more rules for the application of other rules help give us a definitive sense of what the rules are? And the answer is not really, um, because how is the one builder supposed to know when he moves into one application of rules compared to another application of rules. So a sort of system of modification isn't sufficient. In section 87, Wittgenstein says, it may easily look as if every doubt merely reveals an existing gap in these foundations for our language, so that a secure understanding is only possible if we first doubt all that can be doubted and then remove all of these doubts. Now here, there's a cl clear, well, indirect reference to none other than the father of modern philosophy, pardon me, uh, Rene Descartes, right? And Rene Descartes famously begins, uh, well, I guess his first meditation in philosophy by suggesting that we should doubt all things that can be doubted. And then only after we've doubted all of those things, then we have to come up with a sure foundation for knowledge and really solve all these problems. So you can see here that Wittgenstein is indirectly um, basically offering a critique of Descartes and really of modern philosophy in, in whole because really, well, let's put it back here, really after Descartes, I think all of philosophy essentially follows through in this uh, systematic footsteps um, of Descartes by beginning really with this question, this sort of skeptical epistemology and then moving from there to secure a sure foundation from knowledge. If you take an introduction to philosophy class, typically what they'll tell you is that in modern philosophy, epistemology is first philosophy. That is, before we can begin in, by doing with before we can begin doing any philosophy, we have to first recognize what knowledge is, 
and understand what the conditions for knowledge are and how it is we can have clear and distinct ideas. And then from there, we can get to bigger questions like what reality is or the question of what good and wrong and right are and so on and so forth. But you can see here is that Wittgenstein is calling into question this entire paradigm within the history of philosophy. This is a history of philosophy uh, series, and so I want you to begin to try to recognize some of the comparative contrast that um, Wittgenstein's uh, offering for us compared to the sort of new way in which he's trying to uh, tackle these problems of language as opposed to these older views of language. He says, we understand what it means to set a pocket watch to the exact time or to re regulate it to be exact. But what if we're asked, is this exactness ideal exactness or how nearly does it approach the ideal? And this is sort of an interesting thing. You can imagine here that if you're set, major, you know, at the beginning of, of a film, maybe there's a heist. There's, you know, the main characters are going to go on a heist or something. And so they set their watches together, right? They make sure they have the same time on their watch. So you can imagine a scenario where someone says, um, did you set your watch to the exact time? And, and under normal circumstances, that would just mean, well, that it's basically the, the exact same time. But you can ask here, what would it, what if someone then followed up by saying, oh, I see that you've set your watch to the exact time, but is it the ideal exactness? Now notice here, we've now sort of moved into a sort of philosophical problem in which the language of exactness no longer is coupled to a form of life or a form of use where that makes sense, right? I know what exactness means when I'm setting my watch so that way that you and I will arrive at the bank at the same time or something. But if I ask the philosophical question of the essence of exactness, I suddenly am at a loss for words. Notice what Wittgenstein says here. He says, Inexact is really a reproach, and exact is a praise. And that is to say that what is inexact attains its goal less perfectly than what is more exact. Thus, the point here is what we call the goal. Am I inexact when I do not give our distance from the sun to the nearest foot, or tell a joiner the width of a table to the nearest thousandth of an inch? No single ideal of exactness has been laid down. And if you go back to the watch example, you could just easily um, superimpose that same thing. Is an exact time, is the ideal exactness to, um, to the quadrillionth of a second, right? What exactly is ideal? And you can see here is that if we look at how the word exact is used within the language game, we see that exact is really used as a way of praising something and inexact is a way of saying that's not quite correct. Um, it's a way of, of it's, it has its meaning um, in terms of a certain use of language, not in terms of some sort of logically pure idea. And this sort of brings Wittgenstein to the question of logic, actually. Because um, logic, of course, is the foundation of the sciences. We saw that um, when, we, when we looked both at Husserl and when we looked at Frege. And it's clear that if science has meaning, its meaning has to at least be logical, and which means that science is dependent upon this. So logic is the for the logic is a part of the foundation of science. But what does that mean exactly? Well, when we look to the sciences, what we're looking at are the empirical things. We want to understand how things in the world are related, and that means that it looks like that if we treat logic as the foundation of sciences, we're looking for something like the essence of the empirical. But what Wittgenstein suggests is that we, what we need to do is we need to seek to understand what is already in plain view. Rather than looking to how logic functions in some sort of mysterious essential fashion, what we need to do is we need to think about how, how logic works and how sense is how things are, can make sense in a sense in which is available to all of us. And we're going to see Wittgenstein hammer at home this idea that all of these things the, the essence of language is completely in plain view because we use language all the time. We are utterly familiar with using language in that he thinks that this temptation by the philosopher to think about the essence of the empirical or the essence of logic ultimately leads us astray because it leads us away from looking at the way language is used in its ordinary sense. And this, is, this becomes known as ordinary language philosophy, by the way. Right, so take a look here. So you have the analysis of logic. Ultimately, for Wittgenstein, it means that what we're looking at are different types of language games. So if we want to understand the logic of a word, we have to understand the type of language game 
out of which that word has its home, which means that we're talking about types of statements. And here's where Wittgenstein introduces, I think, is an important concept um, for you to recognize with regard to his philosophy. And this is the notion of a philosophical grammar or a logical grammar. In other words, he thinks that the investigation of a language game is a grammatical or a logical investigation. Now, notice how different this is from the type of things that we saw when we looked in Frege's sense and reference distinction. Remember one of the things we saw is that Frege, when he talks about the idea of signs, he recognizes that not every sign has a referent, and so on and so forth. And he sort of says, well, this is because our language is incomplete. Notice that Frege really is after this ideal essence of language. And here Wittgenstein says, no, the analysis of logic is actually a grammatical investigation insofar as language has its certain specific concrete forms of use. And when we approach, go back to the problem of rules, we can say that the clarification of rules works by offering more exact boundary conditions, but that makes the analysis look as if there were a final end stage for the language itself. In other words, this is where the lure of the ideal seems to take place. The more exact we look for these, the way these rules can be articulated, this leads us further and further into this sort of ideal essence of language. And this is a mistake, actually. Um, he says in 92, and I'm going to read this. I apologize for reading all these passages, um, but I just couldn't help myself because I just love the way he goes through this. And also notice how Wittgenstein has a very different style than really all of these other philosophers. Um, so in section 92, he says, this finds expression in questions as to the essence of language of propositions of thought. For if, if we too in these investigations are trying to understand the essence of language, its function and its structure, yet this is not what those questions have in view. For they see in the essence not something that already lies open to view and that becomes surveillable by a rearrangement, but something that lies beneath the surface, something that lies within, which we see when we look into things and which an analysis is going to dig out, as it were. So the essence is something that's hidden from us. Now, this is the form of our problem now assumes. We ask, what is language? What is a proposition? And the answers to these questions is given once for all and independently of any future experience. Now, notice that philosophy, and there's another great philosopher of language, um, Jacques Derrida, who says something very similar here. That the classical, maybe say a sort of a modernist approach to language, would say that we ask the question of essence. So we say, what is language? What is a proposition? Notice that these are no longer the types of questions that Wittgenstein wants us to ask because these types of questions lead us into looking for the essence of something. These are, if you will, classic platonic types of questions. And think of Plato who, or Socrates who would ask, what is justice? And he wanted to get to the essence of justice, something that was hidden from view, but somehow there. Um, and, and here Wittgenstein ultimately is suggesting, don't ask what is a language, rather ask how is, how is language used? How is proposition used? Instead of trying to theorize that there's an object that conforms to the meaning of something, recognize that it's really a whole variety of uses. Um, it's, and it's grounded in the way in which we live, or what Wittgenstein refers to as the Levin's form or our form of life. So, so you see here, there's this, this, there's this, this temptation we might call as a sublime essence of a proposition, where we ask, what is, how does a proposition have meaning and we're after an essence? But here at 96, for instance, Wittgenstein says, these concepts, proposition, language, thought, world, all of these stand in line, one behind each other. Each is equivalent to each other in their sort of ideal sense. But what are these words to be used for now? the language in which they are to be applied is missing. So for instance, if you want, go take a survey of really any philosopher and look at the way in which they use these words like proposition, thought, meaning, essence, existence. And what you're going to see is that the way in which the, if, you, if philosophers give some sort of essentialist definition, then what you have there is you have a language game or, so you have a way of using words in which there is no longer a language game that makes sense. Um, and if there's no language game, Wittgenstein's point here is there is no meaning, actually. 
And so what you have here is Wittgenstein's building this critique of philosophy that I think is important for us in terms of just introducing Wittgenstein's uh, philosophy of language here to understand is that the construction of a language without a corresponding language game is actually a mistake. And it's actually a type of logical nonsense because without a language game, a word doesn't have meaning, really. Um, and if it doesn't have meaning, then what exactly are we doing? Right. He says, whereas, of course, if the words language experience were world have a use, it must be as humble a one as that of words like table, lamp and door. So take so, for instance, take the word phone. Um, there's a way in which we use the word phone um, in its ordinary use. But imagine, for instance, if you asked Plato to define what phone is. Well, what does Plato do? I mean, here, if you're not familiar with Plato, you might want to take a look at my previous videos that explain a little bit or introduce um, some of Plato's concepts. But what Plato thinks is that all of our words, the, 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 the word table actually refers to some sort of ideal essence that lives somewhere else. It doesn't live in this world because all of the things we see as tables are not perfect tables. And so therefore, they're not truly tables. But notice how, how odd and how alienating that kind of philosophy is. Wittgenstein's uh, suggestion to the contrary is that our words like table, our words like justice should also have a more humble um, definition that's rooted in their actual language game or actual form of use. And so another way of looking at the, the question of logic and the way in which we can think about rules here is to ask, well, can there be vagueness in logic, right? It's as if we wanted to say that there has to always be a definite rule. Right. I teach, in fact, it's funny because I was just teaching logic today uh, with a new uh, logic class face to face. And we were talking about vagueness and ambiguity and these sorts of things. And one of the things I was articulating is that when you're doing formal logic, we want to avoid vagueness. Now, um, in, an, in a normal introduction to logic class, that makes sense. But here Wittgenstein is attacking that idea um, in terms of saying that, listen, to, to avoid all vagueness or ambiguity in logic is ultimately to look for something. It's as if we want to look for an absolute definite rule. We can know for sure that's how you use um, the word. So I think the example we were looking at in my logic class, um, I think the example was a woman saw, um, no, no, a woman saw another woman giving birth on her television set, <laughs> right? I think that was the example. And of course, it's ambiguous because did a woman see a person giving birth like represented on the TV screen? Or was there literally a person sitting on um, the television set um, while, you know, and they actually see a person actually giving birth on a television set? Sort of a silly example. But it's an example of ambiguity because you can, you can understand the idea of looking in two different ways. And one of the questions that my students always ask, and, and today was no exception, is, well, wait a second, what about these other statements? Like, for instance, someone says, um, um, the bus comes at two o'clock. Isn't there also ambiguity in the way in which you use the words like come and the bus? Isn't there also ambiguity in that sense? And of course, our logic book doesn't act like there is. But Wittgenstein's point here is, well, actually there is, right? Take a look here at sections 102 and 103. The strict and the clear rules of the logic structure, logical structure of propositions appear to us as something in the background, hidden in the medium of understanding. I already see them even though through a medium for I understand the propositional sign because I use it to say something. The ideal, as we think of it, is unshakable. You can never get outside of it. You must always turn back. There is no outside. Outside, you cannot breathe. Oh, there's that quote. Where does this idea come from? It's like a pair of glasses on our nose through which we see whatever we look at. It never occurs to us to take them off. This is sort of interesting. So it's as if the philosopher is always looking for the essence of things, but it's like they're looking through glasses. And what Wittgenstein suggests is that we take our glasses off. Uh, we take off this essentialism in order to begin to actually look at the way language actually is right there before us. Um, and that's one thing that Wittgenstein will always sort of emphasize is that, is that the, the, 
is that these language games are already there laid out right before us. There's nothing hidden from view. What we have to do is we have to stick to the su subjects of our everyday thinking. So one of the things I want you to get through with Wittgenstein is the notion that Wittgenstein is, is, is asking the philosopher to return to their everyday use of language. Um, why? Because ultimately his view, um, or at least this is my interpretation of his view, is that once we get to back to our everyday thinking, we look to the ordinary ways we use language, what we'll see is that a lot of our philosophical problems will simply disappear. Um, notice he goes on, he says, it's it says, I'll read you, he says, we must stick to the subjects of our everyday thinking and not go astray and imagine that we have to describe extreme subtleties, which in turn, we are, after all, quite unable to describe with the means that are disposable. We feel as if we had to repair a torn spider's web with our fingers. Um, so there's a certain sense in which the philosopher is almost automatically in a frustrating, frustrated position. Because as long as they maintain this, what he says here in 107, this crystalline purity of logic, right? as long as we maintain that, then we're never going to get a strong grasp of what's going on. Um, we're never going to get complete clarity. Um, he says, the conflict becomes intolerable. The requirement is now in danger of becoming empty. We have got we have got onto slippery ice where there is no friction, and so in a certain sense the conditions are ideal, but also be just because of that we're unable to walk. We want to walk, so we need friction. Back to the rough ground. And so Wittgenstein's constantly inviting the philosopher to get away from the temptation for this crystalline, pure, perfect idea and get back to the way things actually are actually spoken in our ordinary lives. Um, and then to use and to, and to recognize that the meaning of our words are derived there. You know, he says that we see that what we, what we call sentence and language doesn't have this formal unity we imagine, but is really a family of structures that are more or less related to one another. In the last video, I mentioned that, for instance, we talked about the idea that if we go along with Wittgenstein's suggestion of language games, then that means that the second idea is that we recognize there's a family resemblance between our words. So in some ways, the use of the sort of rules that govern our use in one language also govern our, our uses in others, but not always exactly in the same way. Um, a sort of interesting example is think of the word, uh, think about if you're playing a ball, a ball game. And now think of the different ways in which, in basketball, you can never, uh, you're never supposed to hold the ball. But for instance, in football, you're supposed to, uh, football meaning American football, you're supposed to hold the ball, right? Um, so the word ball, and we think of ball games, we think about holding balls, but notice that it, it depends upon this context. And if, so if you were to ask, what is a ball in its ideal essence, <laughs> right? You would say, back to the rough ground. You're, you've gone astray. Um, okay, so this now introduces a sort of, we see here Wittgenstein's offering us a suggestion regarding how we can understand philosophy. On the one hand, we're going to see there's good philosophy and bad philosophy. Or he talks about philosophy in two different ways. There's, there's bad philosophy, if you will, the, where the philosopher is looking for these essentialist definitions that lead them to these really bizarre theories that ultimately don't get us any further in terms of uh, really overcoming these philosophical problems. But there's another sense of philosophy that Wittgenstein suggests, and this is the type of philosophy that he's doing, which is the notion that philosophy should be understood as a type of therapy. In other words, that the philosophy of description is a way in which the philosopher can begin to recognize that the philosophical problems that they have or that they can't stop thinking about are really false problems. And what the basic method here is that we have to do away with this theoretical explanation and description alone needs to take its place. And there's something quite interesting here um, <clears throat> is that we're going to see that that um, Husserl, well, we didn't really talk too much about Husserl. We talked about Husserl in terms of logic early in the videos. But Husserl's phenomenology also attempts to emphasize description. And this seems to be one of the primary features of contemporary philosophy is that, is that description becomes the method rather than, um, I guess, theoretical explanation in philosophy. So philosophy is therapy. And there's this 
beautiful and famous quote of Wittgenstein's, which I have to draw your attention to, which is that philosophy in this therapeutic sense is a battle against the bewitchment of our intelligence by means of language. So in other words, he thinks that what happens is, um, is that philosophy, the, the true goal of philosophy, is to help us get clear about how we think about things. And that happens through this description. Um, and it's quite natural and easy um, for us to be lost in our words. So what's the therapy? Well, what we have to do is we have to bring our words back from their metaphysical to their everyday use. If you will, we have to de-platonize our words. Language has to become de-platonic. Um, not neoplatonic, but unplatonic. <laughs> we have to re- we have to sort of reverse it. Um, so this is actually a quite interesting notion because most philosophers or most people studying philosophy tend to use the reverse, right? They have words, um, and then they they try in order to understand those words, they look for some sort of metaphysical sense. Now, what does metaphysics refer to here? Um, well, we can say that metaphysics refers to something like the necessary transcendental conditions, um, or maybe you might say is the something like um, the, uh, if not the transcendental conditions, something like the conditions um, embedded in reality that make our language meaningful. And he says, no, no, you're going in the, in the wrong direction here. Um, so you can see that he's a very different kind of philosopher. And that means that Wittgenstein articulates a sort of special form of nonsense. Now, what is nonsense in the general sense? Well, we can say that nonsense is to have no sense, right? It's to not make sense of something. And in the classic sense, if you took a logic class, what we would say is that nonsense is always the result of contradiction. Contradiction is when you say something both is and is not in the same way at the same time and in the same respect. So you're watching this video right now and you're not watching this video right now. That's contradictory and that's nonsensical. That's sort of the classic type of nonsense. But what Wittgenstein is articulating here is that that philosophers are engaged in a different type of nonsense. It also is contradictory, I suppose, but it's a type of nonsense in which the words themselves no longer are tethered to their actual use, which means that philosophers make long arguments, metaphysical arguments, but ultimately at the end of the day, what they're saying has no meaning because they don't because there's a misunderstanding of what meaning itself is. Or in other words, Wittgenstein says, the results of philosophy are the uncovering of one or another piece of plain nonsense and bumps that the understanding has got by running its head up against the limits of language. Um, so the if we think of philosophy as a therapy, the therapy is what is the therapy for? It's to get us to recognize nonsense. And there's this very interesting discussion here about what therapy means. And we know that Wittgenstein, at least I know from reading his biography here, that he he was very much interested in psychoanalysis and interested in, in Freud and interested in these things. And so he's interested in the notion of therapy. And here you can think of how does Freudian psychoanalysis work, right? Regardless of what you think about Freud, it was re- referred to as the talking cure, right? You get a person who's neurotic in your office, you essentially ask them questions, and there's a number of different techniques that therapists will use. But the goal isn't for the therapist to just tell the patient what's wrong with them, but for the patient to recognize what's wrong with them. That is, for the patient to recognize the source of their neuroses, and that in that recognition, they would Therefore, they would then uh, become free of those neuroses. And so you might say is that there's a sort of similar model here that Wittgenstein's engaged in, is that he thinks that the philosopher has to do this work. How do they do it? They do it through a description of the use of language. So like I mentioned before, here when when Wittgenstein talks about philosophy, he's either talking about uh, philosophy in terms of nonsense, um, um, I think I misspelled that, um, or he's talking about philosophy as a type of therapy. So here's a couple of important quotes. He says, a philosophical problem has the form I don't know my way about. (laughs) Philosophy may in no way interfere with the actual use of language. It can, in the end, only describe it. For it cannot give it any foundation either, 
it leaves everything as it is. So in other words, the goal of the philosopher shouldn't be to correct the way in which people use language, but rather to glean insight from the way in which people use language so as to recognize the types of nonsense, grammatical nonsense, that we are um, prone to do and prone to commit. Philosophy simply puts everything before us in terms of this descriptive method, and it neither explains nor deduces anything. Since everything lies open to plain view, there is nothing to explain. For what is hid hidden, for example, is of no interest to us. There's another quote here which I didn't put on here where Wittgenstein says that a philosophical problem has the characteristic of having depth, right? As if it's something hidden deep in the recesses, and if only we could get away from all of this ordinary life stuff and get to the depth, to the metaphysical depth of something. And here Wittgenstein suggesting, no, that's not really what philosophy needs to do, at least not the philosophical therapy he's advocating, right? The hidden lies in plain view. So we now we can ask this question, well, how does the idea of a language game really help for a philosophy of therapy? Well, it's quite simple. A language game um, operates by allowing us to recognize grammatical comparisons. So we can say there's one language game works this way. I'll go back to the example I gave earlier of the word soul. In, in when you're praying, the word soul means one thing. And if you're you know listening to uh, music, R&B music, the word soul means a different thing. And when we begin to compare these things, we recognize similarities and dissimilarities. And those similarities and dissimilarities are grounded in their use. And then from there, we can begin to un unfurl the idea or negate the idea that there's some universal essence to all of them. Um, and that's very difficult because I think Wittgenstein suggests we tend to do this. I, I mentioned Derrida earlier, but I forgot to continue that Derrida also says that the primary question of philosophy today isn't the question of what is blank, what is the essence of something. It's not a question of what at all. It's rather, well, I'm not sure exactly how he phrases it off the top of my head, but in the context of this discussion of Wittgenstein, it's not a question of what, it's a question of how. Um, so it is not our aim, Wittgenstein says, to refine or complete the system of rules for the use of our word words in some unheard of ways. Think of how Plato does this. For the clarity we're aiming at is indeed complete clarity, but this simply means that the philosophical problems should completely disappear. disappear. Because notice that, that what Wittgenstein has argued is that the more exact and the more ideal uh, definition we give to our words and to our language, the more... Um, foreign and alien our, our analyses become. So that means that since the use of language is there before us, that the goal of philosophy is simply to for us to completely get rid of these philosophical problems because we recognize that they're predicated on forms of nonsense. So if it can sense there's, there, it's not as if there is a philosophical method, there, though there are indeed methods like there's different therapies. Now, here's an example. Now, this is not an example that Wittgenstein gives, at least not in these passages. But here's an example that I will use um, for many of you who are studying philosophy, which is the famous debate between freedom and determinism. Are we free or are we determined, right? This is a famous debate. A colleague of mine loves to debate this with me. Um, he thinks we're all determined, right? What does this mean? Well, gen generally the debate is this, that... Um, <clears throat> that we seem to have an experience in which we're free, but we also know, and that's that experience tends to be forward looking, right? And so I'm thinking, as soon as this video is done, I'm gonna do this, or I could do this, and I recognize, well, there's different options of things I can do. But notice that when I think about determinism, I have a sort of backward looking perspective in which I notice that, um, at least according to the physical laws of the universe, one event causes another event, which causes another event. And that causal structure is um, necessary, right? So for instance, uh, if I drop something, it falls to the ground because gravity, let's say, or the gravitational pull of the earth causes it to fall, and there's no choice. The problem with freedom determinism is, well, is, couldn't, the, those, isn't the, couldn't the laws of physics also be applied to us, such that our experience of freedom is an illusion? Um, or, our, or is it that our, our um, 
our backward looking view that things are determined is an illusion, right? And there's lots of, and for instance, last semester I was giving a, a seminar on identity and what we were reading this essay where they're, they're talking about freedom and determinism and, and this philosopher, I won't say his name because I can't remember the top of my head, uh, but the philosopher we're looking at, his suggestion was, well, it's clear that there is a determined structure for the universe, but it's also clear that we do have freedom in some sense because we experience it. We have an intuition of it. And so he suggested, well, maybe freedom is kind of like the unmoved mover in Aristotle. Now, if you're not familiar with the unmoved mover, take a look at one of my videos on it. Um, but what the unmoved mover is for Aristotle, it's the principle which governs motion, um, but which it itself is not in motion. And so there's this sort of odd thing where this philosopher is seeming to say that we're both determined and we're free. Now, what I think here is that this whole debate, and here I have some pictures of some books that philosophers have written about freedom and determinism. And here I'm not making a critique against these books, but simply saying that this debate in philosophy between freedom versus determinism, and of course, if you take an intro to philosophy class or you take a class on this, you'll find out that there's different positions. There's compatibilist, there's incompatibilist, there's universal determinist, there's soft determinist, and so on and so forth. Everyone seems to have a metaphysical position. But I'll now notice that none of these philosophers have ever really been able to determine with absolute certainty to, um, whether or not we're really free or determined to the point that we stop asking the question. We're still writing books on freedom versus determinism. What would Wittgenstein say about this entire problem? I think from what we've looked at in philosophical investigations, it's pretty clear what he would say. He would say, well, instead of theorizing what freedom is, saying that freedom is some sort of metaphysical um, um, indeterminacy, or in, it, it, we should look to the way in which we actually use these words. Notice the language game, the language games in which we might talk about freedom, right? We might say that uh, the jailer has taken away her freedom. Well, that makes sense within that use, right? Um, you know, for instance, if if someone says that, or think if we say that um, um, he got he got cancer because of his genetics. He was determined to get it no matter what. Notice that the language of determinism also has a language game that it for which it has a home. And what it looks like here is that Wittgenstein thinks that once we keep our glasses on, as it were, and we be, we sort of take on this essentialist project, we move towards some sort of theory. But that theory has no language game. It has no home, which means that it doesn't really have meaning. Um, and so Wittgenstein's critique here is that problems like freedom versus determinism or other types of problems like what is goodness itself, what is intrinsic goodness, these types of philosophical topics and debates are all um, examples of philosophical nonsense. And that the way in which we get around them, or the way in which we broach these problems, is ultimately to recognize the different uses of language. Um, and for me, this to me, this has sort of solved the problem of freedom and determinism for me. Which is namely that I don't think that there is a metaphysical problem here, right? We simply, there's simply a different language game for these different terms. And that there's a philosophical mistake in trying to conflate them together. Now, I'm sure some of you are going to completely disagree with me because the freedom and determinism debate is a really big debate and most people who study philosophy eventually have some sort of position on it. Um, it's sort of funny, years ago when I when I first got started teaching full-time, uh, when I first got a, a, a assistant professorship, the uh, the a, the chair of the psychology department called me to you know say hello and to welcome me to the college. But one of the things he said to me is, are you, are you a freedom person or are you a determinist person? <laughs> and, you know, how do you answer that question um, from a Wittgensteinian perspective? I think I said, well, I guess I side with freedom. He said, well, I'm for determinism. He hung up the phone. Now, we've had lots of debates about it. But ultimately, my position is that there really is no problem. This is a false philosophical problem. And I think that's the kind of um, broad, if we were to take it broadly speaking, that's the kind of way in which we could begin to apply Wittgenstein's analysis of philosophy as therapy to specific concrete philosophical problems we actually encounter. Now, I've gone on for a long time, and there's other things that Wittgenstein discusses in this section, including 
He talks about mental processes, and we're going to talk about that next time, a little bit more about propositions and signs, and even a reference to the picture theory of meaning from the Tractatus. Um, but I'm not going to go into those now, because I really just want you, I want this lecture to be one in which you begin to recognize um, the way in which Wittgenstein is understanding his method of description in terms of its approach to philosophy. I hope this has been helpful and I hope that it's been interesting. Well, don't worry, we're going to have another uh, video here on Wittgenstein coming up soon, so stay tuned for that. And a lot of these themes will come up again. So thank you very much for watching. This has been Contemporary Philosophy on the Philosophical Investigations. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys online. Bye.